this will be the first time I've set up the uh, enlarging machine with the intention of actually using it. I've set it up a couple of times to uh, uh, see if it works and uh, try a few things out, but this time I'm going to use it to enlarge the uh, half-scale plaster model for the figure I'm carving into a full-scale uh, clay that I'll then turn into a full-scale plaster model to use pointing with. So um, this should be fun. I've covered how this thing works before, so I'm going to kind of speed through it. Uh, so I'm going to level the bench up and uh, uh, with some shims under the feet, because this, this basement floor is a little, uh, cement floor is a little uneven. And uh, I'm going to tack the, uh, the shims uh, to it, because I, I want this to be very stable. I don't think this to be wiggling, waving around. I don't know that it logically actually needs to be level, uh, but everything's somehow simpler when things are level. Um, so I'm, I'm going to level it up long ways and um, side to side, put some shims under it, nail them in place, and, uh, um, um, and, and have a firm workspace. Now I won't be able to move it at all because uh, every part of the floor is uneven differently. So um, I, I've tried to pick a place where I can photograph from here. So here comes the enlarging machine, uh, stage right. I guess that's on your left. Uh, this is you know, made right here in the shop. Uh, it's sort of a complete hodgepodge of pieces made on the lathe and milling machine and, and uh, uh, you know, some uh, you know, store-bought plumbing fittings that have been you know, turned on the machines to turn them into various and sundry parts. It's got some special you know, gearing I ordered from a bicycle supply house. But uh, all in all, it's uh, completely homemade. So let me give a quick overview of how this works, and then we'll, we'll look at each of the parts separately. That's a, uh, this boom swivels on that post, and it, it has a, sort of a universal joint that twists and uh, goes up and down. And this long boom, that silver rod, uh, turns on its own axis, and it holds a pantograph. And that pantograph can kind of uh, points at the little sculpture and marks the corresponding spot in space at the other end where the big sculpture is. See this, the pantograph sort of uh, can move that way and the, the beam that it's on swivels like that. And then the whole thing swings up and down on that shoulder point and it swivels um, in a vertical axis as well. So it, uh, it's got quite a lot of degrees of freedom. Uh, we're, we're looking at each of these parts separately, but you can kind of see how, how you can get it uh, uh, from a wide range of angles, you can get at any given point on your sculpture. There's one more sort of degree of freedom, which is the swiveling work tables. You notice the, uh, the, the, the two tables swivel and they're locked together by a chain, so they, they're in the same relative position no matter which way you turn them. Now the, the arm, if you look at it, is sort of defining a, sw a spherical stripe uh, you know, uh, that intersects with the, uh, uh, with the two tables, you know, a larger sphere and a smaller sphere. And uh, so you can really only get at certain stripe of your work from a, a limited range of angles with the pantograph. But with the ability to turn the tables, you can rotate the pieces through those two spheres and, uh, and come at all sides. It's really a pretty cool invention. Uh, th th not my invention, by the way. This this is a, a, a bit. This basic design is uh, is is well known and has been used for I don't know, 150 years or something. But uh, it's a very elegant design. Um, I was surprised. The barbell weights uh, exactly balance the, the long boom, so it's basically weightless. It's actually slightly heavier on the boom side, so that it'll sink down to the table and not fly up and hit the ceiling. But uh, you can see it just it just pivots on that pin, uh, and then this if you if you look in my left hand I'm tightening a, a nut there that locks it so it can no, it can't swing up and down uh, once it's locked or at least can't unless, unless you put some pressure on it. That 
uh, top section of the post that the uh, swivel, the up and down swiveling uh, point is attached to, uh, turns. And uh, down at the bottom, there's a screw that you can lock to stop the swiveling. So uh, here, uh, it's, it's that little screw. There's a cute little wrench for it that I've mislaid. I, I made a little wrench. Um, and see, now it's tight, and, and the, the post won't swivel. And I'll just loosen it a little bit, um, and now the post uh, swivels uh, freely. So that's to allow you to get it sort of in position and, uh, and then uh, freeze it there to do some work. Uh, it's a little more complicated than that. I'll, I'll show you in a second. So when you get the uh, uh, pin positioned on your, your small model, and now you have a, identified a point in space in the big model, you, you, you want to be able to move that beam out of the way, but have it return to the exact same spot. And that's what that weird exclamation point looking thing is. That bolts to the frame, to the, wooden, the gray wooden framework, and um, you just tighten a bolt, and now you can swing the arm back up to it. So uh, you'll see in a second. Um, See, it's out of the way. Now, imagine I positioned it right to this point here, right? Uh, I've, I've just locked that beam down for a second. Now I can put this right up against the bar just to touch the bar, tighten it, and now I'll be able to, to swing that bar out of the way. Uh, it'll retain, you know, I've locked the, uh, the, the angle at which the beam is up and down, and but now it I can just swivel it out of the way and then just bring it back uh, to where it kisses that exclamation point again uh, so I can verify, say, that the point I'm working on on the model, I've actually built the clay up on the, uh, uh, on the far end to the right level. See? So I just swing it back, boom, it's right there. So it's sort of an indexing scheme. The pivot, the, the very center of the pivot that the, uh, the big boom swings on, and the tip of the little pointer and the tip of the big pointer all need to be in a perfectly straight line. Um, now, the, uh, to do two-to-one enlargement, it means that the, the near pointer, uh, one close to the shoulder, has to be half the distance of uh, uh, out all the way out to the end, from the center point of that shoulder pivot all the way out to the uh, where the pantograph pivots. So what I've done here is I've just basically uh, used the tables, which are all in line with the center point of the pivot, the t tops of the tables. I've got those pivots parallel and uh, exactly pointing at the center of, of both tables. So um, it's a uh, that's the key insight, is you have to have the center point of the, of the shoulder pivot, like the axis of rotation and center side to side, has to line up with the tip of the, of, of the two pointers. So the magic is, once you've done that, you have a system of similar triangles. Um, uh, you could, when you, <laughs> once you play with this, you, could, you can just see it's, it's like an elementary school geometry textbook. Uh, you have uh, the, the tips of the pointers, and the pivot points of the pair of the uh, pantograph and the shoulder all form uh, similar triangles of with the bigger one x times the size of the smaller one. In this case, two times. It's so cool. And then, so as long as the laws of similar triangles and the way parallelograms behave uh, continue to be obeyed, this thing just automatically works. It's so cool. It might sound confusing now, but once you see me do this a couple of times, you'll just laugh. It's so obvious how it works. It's a very nifty invention. Now here's the, uh, uh, the view from the end, what it looks like when it's um, all set up. See, there's, there's the beam, and they, those two points, when they, um, uh, when they swing down, they should if I touch the center point of one table with the, um, uh, the small pointer, the big pointer should touch the center point of the, of the corresponding table. And uh, once, once that's correct, everything should, uh, uh, should just naturally follow it. Everything should scale correctly. 
And the two tables, of course, are chained together, so they're, they're keeping the two pieces always at the same rotational angle uh, uh, relative to the beam. That uh, indexing thing that looks like an exclamation point is a great idea, but the way it's attached is awful. Got to change that. It's just way too much trouble to, to lock it in position. Should be an easy fix, but uh, it's just not acceptable as it is. It's also a little too short. It needs to go up another six or eight inches longer, so uh, I may just have to rework that entirely. Here you get a good view of the extra support under the target table. Remember, um, the volume of something goes up uh, with the cube of the change in the linear dimension. So if you double the size of something, uh, it's got eight times the volume. So, you know, if something weighs 10 pounds uh, uh, as a solid piece of plaster uh, on the source table, on the target table, it's going to weigh 80 pounds. Uh, uh, so it's, uh, it's got to be quite a lot more robust. Those are skate wheels uh, mounted there on bearings. So there, uh, uh, there's uh, four of them. So you could actually put a, a lot of weight on that target table. I, I don't know how much, but I think I could easily stand on it and shift my weight around and be fine. So the next step here is going to be to uh, um, mount the small sculpture on here and then start building the uh, uh, support armature for the big one right on that post, uh, right on that, that tabletop. Uh, next time I'll, I'll mount the original and make the armature. Uh, thanks for watching this. Um, uh, all the other footage is actually done. I just uh, um, haven't had time to make the videos. So um, I'll try to get that out immediately. See you next time.